I'm Melissa Goman. I'm the visual arts director for the Paramount. I'm so pleased to have been involved in the, um, the coordination of this exhibition. Gallery St. Germain is the gallery across the street, and I need to thank our funders. The McKnight Foundation has given us two years worth of funding um, to have Gallery St. Germain to do exactly that. <laughs> Last winter, Louise Mugley, who's over here, raise your hand, Louise. <laughs> Louise came to me last winter. She's one of our ceramic students and a friend of Bela's and said, you know, it would be really nice to do a show of Bela's work. And I agreed. So I uh, contacted Mickey Cunningham, and Mickey has been doing a lot of the work uh, to help get this organized and arranged. And so I just had had the joy of being able to help collect the work and put all the logistics together, but Mickey Cunningham really deserves a lot of that. <laughs> At when this uh, concludes, I'd like to invite you all to go back over to Gallery St. Germain. The food and the wine will still be poured. Uh, and also, please uh, look at the work of Bela's students and friends that have contributed work for the Bela Circle show here. So I'm going to turn it over to Mickey. Thank you, Melissa. Good afternoon, everyone. It's lovely to see such a great turnout and many familiar faces here to celebrate and honor our dear friend Bela. I'd like to thank Melissa, too, for enthusiastically Embracing, is this loud enough back there? Hold it up, okay. Enthusiastically embracing this idea to celebrate Bela's 80th year. I'd also like to thank the ever gracious Derek Siegerstrom of the Paramount for all his help. Thanks too to Bela and his lovely wife Kathy who let Melissa and me come into his studio several times to ransack the place <laughs> and look for work. Um, I, I also would like to take this opportunity to make special note of all the lenders to the exhibition across the street. It's not often that we laud the buyers of art, but I think that we should. They support work that enriches our lives and makes our environments aesthetically pleasing. They, so they also deserve thanks because they've lived with an empty spot on their wall for the last month. And fortunately after today, they get to take their prized possession home. Uh, for the rest of us, however, there are some party favors to be had. You will find books on tables here and across the way and they have been generously contributed by, by Bela and Kathy. They're of Bela's 2001 retrospective out at St. John's University. So our original intent for these exhibitions is that they be something of a birthday celebration in honor of Bela's 80th year. So if this is the birthday party, then all of the paintings are the gifts. And they are gifts for all of us to drink in and enjoy. And of course, they're also gifts for Bela. I imagine that the chance for him to see a group of his paintings brought together in a lovely space like the Gallery St. Germain would be joyful. But so would it be fun, too, for him to see some paintings that have been hidden away in private collections for some time. So the, both of these exhibitions are not curated in the traditional sense. The show across the street does not attempt to be a retrospective, although it does span 40 years of Bela's career. It's not a, an attempt to shed some light on his position in the broader context of American art. There's no didactic labeling. The paintings are hung with the simple intent to appeal aesthetically and they stand and shine on their own. The paintings here in the circle exhibition are gifts as well. This also was not curated. We merely invited artists who have painted or studied or have been colleagues of Bela's to submit one or two paintings 
and to honor him with a recollection, a reminiscence of working with him. If you haven't done so yet, I encourage you, invite you to read the labels. They're, they're fun, humorous, and touching. And I'd also like to recognize the various artists who are represented in the circle show. So same, same goes here. If you would give us a wave or stand up, I'd like to read your names. Maybe this time we could hold applause until the end. So I will just read the names. Doug Lean, Jill Double D. Kuhn, Dave Matthews, Harriet Braun, Dan Mondlock, Dee Dee Leiter, Carol Spriggs, Bob McCoy, Jim Hendershot, Shirley Hovey, Barbara Rogren, John Heckman, and me. I had the pleasure to introduce Bela about 10 years ago when he was honored with a Lifetime Achievement Award in the Arts here at the Paramount. At that time, I recounted his bio, including his training in art and art history in Hungary, his harrowing nighttime escape from his homeland when the Soviets invaded, his, his refuge in Vienna, where he briefly studied at Oskar Kokoschka's famous school of seeing, his immigration to the United States, and his years of teaching at St. John's University. But many of you know him. And, or have read of his history. So today I'd like to do something a little bit different, something a little bit more personal. I'd like to paint a picture for you of what it's like to paint with Bela. So I'm going to describe one of our painting group's typical Friday sessions here at the Paramount. So imagine, if you will, not a dark and stormy night, but a cold and blustery morning. Bela arrives early as always. He's dressed in a black wool coat, scarf tucked just so, and black beret cocked at a jaunty angle. He could be stepping out in Walmart with Picasso. He carries a, an old wooden paint box, a canvas, and his signature multicolored print bag, no doubt from the 1970s. When he doffs his coat, he is artfully don wears artfully patched corduroys. I mean, this guy really knows how to chic the shabby. <laughs> Next, he dons his scrubs blue doctor's coat. This thing is caked with paint. There are some pictures around here because Bela often wipes his coat, his brush on his coat, especially the left sleeve. <laughs> he looks like a Jackson Pollock come to life. <laughs> As Bela proceeds to ready his painting spot, he draws old sea clamps out of his natty floral bag. And with them, he attaches to his easel his favorite, favorite rectangular piece of perfectly seasoned masonite to use as his palette. Next, the canvas goes up on the easel. And this isn't the ubiquitous Frederick's pre-stretched plastic wrap number that I might use. Oh no, Bela has carefully hand-stretched a canvas, which he's primed with acrylic in his favorite greened down yellow ochre. Darn if it isn't artful already. <laughs> As the model is being posed, Bela lays out his paints, and he banters with all the other artists arriving. He also begins to take careful stock of our model. Does she have the countenance of a Raphael Madonna? Does she have the long neck of a Parmigianino? Does he call to mind Franz Hall's Jolly Toper? Sometimes his art historical refer references become more arcane. He once said to me something like, Mickey, the muted colors and regal bearing of our model calls to mind Puvis de Chavon. I mean, you gotta love it. Who tosses around names like that? <laughs> After the pose is set, Bela begins to draw in charcoal. He has already made decisions about how much of the figure he will include on his canvas. 
With remarkable skill and speed, he captures the sitter's gesture, recording the exact tilt of the head and the way the nose turns up at the tip. It's all there in just a few lines. Then the real opening act begins. Bela begins to scrub in color, all the while observing the lights and darks. The figure begins to emerge. A sense of flesh develops. If you look away for a moment, it feels like sleight of hand. There seems to be something of the prestidigitator in Bela. Towards the middle of the session, Bela applies a homogenizing stain of cadmium red and yellow ochre mixed with plenty of medium, better known as the juice. He describes this as giving the model a suntan without having to send her to Puerto Verarte. Now the high point of the show takes place. His brush moves quickly with small, delicate strokes. He applies dashes of color that sing and dance. You witness it happening, but still marvel. How did, it, how did he make that green pop? How did he achieve that perfect purple? As the session winds down, Bela announces that it is now the bitter end. Despite his humorous self-deprecation, he has done it again. Another beautiful painting has taken shape. It all feels a bit magical. But I think the real magic of painting with Bela is something beyond watching his mastery unfold. It's something more ineffable. It's the way standing next to him makes you feel the possibility of your own mastery. As long as I have known Bela, he has been the consummate artist, striving to improve his work, all the while gen genuinely interested in sharing his knowledge and in encouraging others. When you stand alongside him, and feel that positive and generous spirit, it gives great hope and joy. And that is the true magic of Bela. Thank you very much. Here are the uh, notes of uh, Nikki. So the great temp tempta the, the great temp temptation for me would be to read them out again. <laughs> 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 but uh, this would make the event uh, pretty dull. So you have to uh, listen to my remarks, you know, which might be even more dull. So, uh, by and large, I don't know whether uh, she is right that I influenced so many people. You know, it's, um, I think uh, I met so many people, you know, but I don't know to what an, to what an extent I really influenced them. You know, but uh, um, the, the best thing is just to sit down, you know, and uh, in front of the work, you know, so the best thing would be to go back uh, to the small gallery and uh, see what is there, you know, and then uh, I, can, I can talk about uh, these things a little bit more, more and better. But I'm, I'm very grateful, you know, that uh, this institution undertook uh, this whole thing, you know, this is uh, rather a major event in my life. So I'm again very grateful. Uh, thank you very much.